very much, David. Um, it is my great pleasure and honor to join you today for two main reasons. Um, in 2009, the Color Society of Australia organized a Congress in, in Sydney. And um, at the General Assembly, I announced precisely the establishment of the International Color Day in Sydney. So uh, little did I know then <laughs> that 14 years later, I would be addressing almost 300 registrants uh, for this incredible uh, celebration. Uh, congratulations to the Color Society of Australia in the person of Dr. David Briggs for this enormous um, achievement. The International Color Day has, um, has had many uh, celebrations throughout uh, these 15 years. Um, and um, this year we will launch the history of the Color Day uh, so that we have an idea of what has been um, going on uh, in in various uh, various uh, countries, at least twenty eight regular members. Um, the second reason is that uh, Dr. David Briggs is the co chair of the AIC study group on arts and design, um, which was launched in Lisbon at the AIC uh, meeting uh, in in Lisbon in uh, two thousand and eighteen, um, and last year. Uh, when I rejoined the AIC executive committee, I looked for somebody who would co-chair with me, and I was very honored to, to that uh, Dr. David Briggs accepted to do so. So we have many years ahead in joint collaborations. Um, this group is concerned with a vast range of disciplines uh, from the spectrum of arts and design, and the two lectures that are presented here today are inscribed in the arts and design areas, and um, it has an extra interest because both David Briggs and Tristan Elwell are practicing artists, which adds an essential layer to their uh, creative minds, the hands-on color material experience which I'm, I'm sure will delight us today. Um, I will now be presenting Dr. David Briggs, um, just a very short uh, bio. Uh, Dr. David Briggs has been teaching classes on color for more than 20 years and currently teaches at the National Art School and the University of Technology in Sydney. His publications include a chapter in the Routledge Handbook of Philosophy of Color, and a two-part paper on the elements of color, currently in press with the Journal of the International Color Association. He also has two outreach websites, which if I may add are a very great success, the dimension of color and color online, both color online and the dimensions of color are both extremely successful. David is past president, vice president, and North South Wales divisional chair of the Color Society of Australia, co-chair of the AIC study group on arts and design, and is a committee member of the AIC ISCC Color Literacy Project. His courses open to the public include an eight-week online course, Understanding and Applying Color, and various on-campus courses, all offered by the National Art School in Sydney. Please join me in welcoming David Briggs with his lecture, Controlling Color, Historical Background. Thanks very much, Maria Joao, and thanks everyone here for attending. Tristan is going to be talking about an implementation of the Munsell color system for painting that was devised in the mid 20th century. And as background to that, I want to talk about the Munsell system and the long history leading up to it, and a bit about the reception of that system in the context of other colour frameworks in the first half of the 20th century. The Munsell system is a classification of colours according to three attributes. In terms of the standard modern terminology published in the International Lighting Vocabulary of the CIE or Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage, these attributes are called hue, lightness and chroma. 
Hue, represented by the position around the colour wheel, is described in the Munsell system in relation to five what are called principal hues, red, yellow, green, blue and purple. And there are normally 40 hues specified in relation to those five principal hues. Lightness, which is also known as value, grayscale value, or especially in Australia and the UK, tone, refers to the scale between black and white through various greys. And this is specified in the Munsell system in terms of Munsell value, which ranges from zero to 10, where zero is a theoretical perfect absorber of light, and 10 is a theoretical perfect reflector of light. And then we have chroma for intensity of color. Chroma has often been equated with saturation, but saturation is now defined as a separate attribute. So we have 40 hues around the circle, and for each hue, there's what you could call a hue page that shows all the variations of Munsell value and Munsell chroma for that hue. And what we discover is that whatever set of paints we use, the range of lightnesses and chromas of paints we can create varies depending on the hue. So that different hues reach their maximum chroma at different values. For example, yellow reach their maximum chroma at higher values than other hues. And also different hues reach different maximum chromas we get to much higher chromas for reds, oranges, and yellows than for hues between blue and green. So when we put all these different shaped hue pages together, we get an irregular tree shape like uh, we see lower, lower right. The CIE defines the word colour in the perceptual sense as a characteristic of a visual perception that can be described by attributes of hue, brightness or lightness, and colourfulness or saturation or chroma. That might look like they're giving alternative names for just three attributes, but those are actually six differently defined attributes of colour and lightness and chroma are two of those six attributes that specifically apply to colors perceived as belonging to an object called object colors. So let's look at this concept of an object color a little closer. If you look at the cube shown here, hopefully you'll get the impression of a cube that's uniformly colored as if it was painted all over with the same paint of the same orange hue medium lightness or value, and high Munsell chroma. When we can freely examine an object in daylight, the color we perceive it as having is a good indication of an intrinsic property of the object called its spectral reflectance, its percentage reflectance of each wavelength of light. The way I like to put it is that the, the object color is the way in which we perceive this physical property of the object of spectral reflectance. And if you were familiar with the spectral reflectances of objects, you'd be able to infer that this object has a spectral reflectance that has a strong bias towards long wavelengths of light. That is, the paint strongly reflects certain, a certain range of long wavelengths and strongly absorbs shorter wavelengths. The hue of the paint is the way in which we perceive the direction of bias towards some wavelengths more than others. The chroma is the way we perceive the amount of bias. And the lightness is the way in which we perceive the overall proportion of light that's falling on the object that's being reflected. So these attributes of lightness and chroma are the ways in which we perceive different aspects of the spectral reflectance of the object. We tend to see those aspects of the spectral reflectance as a fairly consistent lightness and chroma under a wide range of different conditions, especially under different intensities of the same illumination. It's really because we tend to see the lightness and chroma as being consistent in different areas of the object that we perceive these attributes as belonging to the object. Now, while we perceive this cube as having a uniform lightness and chroma, at the same time, as we go from area A to area B to area C, we see that the appearance is becoming brighter and more colorful. 
these attributes of brightness and colourfulness refer to the appearance of the light reaching our eyes from different areas of the object, as opposed to the colour we see belonging to the object. In the same way, if we look at the lighter coloured areas of, on the floor, we perceive these as being white things of a uniform high lightness. But the brightness of the light reaching our eyes from different areas varies greatly. In contrast to lightness and chroma, we perceive the varying brightness and colourfulness of the different areas of the object as being imposed on the object by the illumination, rather than as belonging to the object itself. So they're not perceived as being part of the object colour. So although three attributes or dimensions are enough to describe colours of objects, if we're trying to describe the appearance of illuminated objects, we need at least five attributes. We need brightness and colourfulness as well. So that's five of those six attributes. The sixth one, which I'll mention because it will come up later, is saturation in the modern sense which is defined as the colourfulness of an area judged in proportion to its brightness. Looking at areas A, B and C again, these vary in colourfulness and brightness, but their colourfulness relative to their brightness remains similar for the three areas. So we could say that the saturation is similar. This shows one reason why saturation can be important. The light from different areas of a uniform object under different intensities of the same illumination tends to follow these lines of uniform saturation. So to get there, that relationship in a painting, we might have the chroma of our paints increase in step with their lightness in order to represent this appearance of the colourfulness increasing in step with the brightness. The framework of hue, lightness and chroma seems so common sense that it may come as a surprise how short a time it's been around. And even the idea of a colour wheel, which many might assume to go back many centuries, actually only goes back to Newton in 1704. Going back to the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci has been credited as being the first theorist to make a distinction between lightness and brightness on the one hand, as Chiarezza, and chromatic intensity, chroma and colourfulness, on the other as bellezza, literally beauty. There are tantalising hints that he might have thought of hues as forming a circle, in that there are a couple of passages where he talks about blue and yellow as being direct contrasts, and also red and green. But really it's part of a laundry list of contrasts that also includes black versus white and pale colours versus red. So it seems like he didn't put together the idea of hues forming a circle. Instead, when he describes what he calls the simple colours, he describes them in a linear sequence between white and black, with yellow the first one close to white, and then green, blue, red, followed by black. The linear sequence is an arrangement that goes right back to Aristotle. Aristotle thought of five colours as being arranged on a linear scale between black and white, and this linear framework with many variations reappears throughout the Middle Ages to the Renaissance and even beyond. This is a long way from Munsell, but even so, we already have the idea of certain chromatic colours like yellow being closer to white and blue being closer to black, and as it happens, the five colours that Aristotle chose for his scale are the same as the five principal hues of the Munsell system. Alongside these linear arrangements, from the Middle Ages onwards, there are multilinear arrangements in which colours form a number of families stretching between black and white. These appear in the writings of Arabic authors in the Middle Ages and Alberti in the Renaissance, but the first illustrations of this sort of arrangement are from a manuscript by Siegfriedus Forsius from 1611. 
Forsius describes what he calls an ancient arrangement with two families and what he calls the right arrangement with five families, including a scale stretching between white and black through grey and four scales comprising tints and shades of red, yellow, green and blue. Just two years later came the first printed diagram of colour relationships by, by Francois d'Aguillon, who was a friend of Rubens, and he came up with this elegant reconciliation of a linear scale of colours of white, yellow, red, blue and black, and these multiple families here, like we saw in Forcius and Alberti. We have one family stretching from white directly to black, and others going from white to yellow to black, another going to, from white to red to black, and so on. And then what's new here is that green has been taken off the linear scale as being a combination of yellow and blue. If we follow this series of loops in the lower half of the diagram, we go through yellow, orange or gold, red, purple, blue, green, and back to yellow. So we have the circuit of hues there shown in a diagram, but attached to this linear scale. Variations on this model persisted through the 1600s, and it wasn't until Newton published the first colour circle in 1704 that the circuit of hues was separated from this scale. When that happened, the next logical step was to have some sort of symmetrical colour model, such as a double pyramid or a double cone or a sphere, in which the circuit of hues runs around the equator at right angles to an axis between black and white. A few variations on this idea were published in the 18th and 19th centuries, and they persist through to the simple colour sphere of Johannes Itten and the double cone arrangements of the HLS or HSL digital colour space. A problem with all of these symmetrical models is that they put the strongest colour of every hue at the equator. And as we saw, these vary in lightness, so the vertical dimension in these models doesn't consistently represent lightness throughout the solid. The important step of applying a lightness scale consistently to all colours was taken by Gaspard Grégoire in the early 19th century. He came up with a classification of colours in relation to a hue circle and lightness scale as shown here. And he was explicitly aware that different hues at their maximum intensity would occupy different levels on that grayscale. However, his work had very little influence. A little later, Chevreul developed a hemispherical colour model that was a dead end, and it wouldn't be until the 20th century that models for object colours with a consistent lightness dimension were developed. In the middle of the 19th century, there was a complete revolution in our understanding of colour that began with two papers by Hermann von Helmholtz in 1852. One of these papers debunked a theory that had been prevalent up to that time, that white light is physically made of red, yellow and blue rays. The second paper debunked the idea that the colour green is made of yellow and blue by explaining how subtractive mixing works, showing that when we mix yellow and blue paints to get a green mixture, the colours yellow and blue aren't mixing to make green. Instead, we get green because the two paints both reflect some green wavelengths, and it's those green wavelengths that are in common that survive subtractive mixing processes, such as paint mixing. Helmholtz went on to create a great synthesis of this new understanding of colour from work by many others as well as himself in his Handbook of Physiological Optics completed in 1867. The book that more than any other transmitted this new understanding of colour to artists and designers was Ogden Rood's Modern Chromatics of 1879. This colour model by Ogden Rood should not be mistaken for an object colour model representing lightness, as it's actually a model of colours of light in which lights at the same vertical level vary widely in brightness. In this respect, it's very similar to the simple digital colour space called HSB, with B for brightness, or HSV, V for value 
in which the so in which the vertical so-called B or V dimension doesn't actually show either actual brightness or value, but rather relative brightness for a given hue and saturation. Scientists from Helmholtz and Rood through to the early 20th century were content to specify and describe colours of light, and it was left to three artists and art teachers, all active in the Boston area, to come up with consistent lightness-based colour models. Albert Munsell, Denman Ross and Arthur Pope. An alternative approach, not based on lightness, was developed by the German chemist Wilhelm Ostwald. Incidentally, the drawing of Denman Ross here is by the painter John Singer Sargent. And there's another interesting connection with Sargent in that in 1917, when Munsell gave up due to illness, his studio in Boston that he'd used since 1901, it was taken over by Sargent. Munsell published the basic concept of his system in 1905 in a book called A Colour Notation that already explains the idea that different hues reach different maximum chromas and reach those maximum chromas at different lightnesses. He then published his system as an atlas of physical colour chips in 1915. In this, there are five pages showing pairs of opposite hues and a series of horizontal slices through the space. After Munsell died in 1918, his son Alex took over the Munsell Colour Company and employed a team of scientists to improve the system. They published this improved version in 1929 as the Munsell Book of Colour, which has extensive explanatory material at the start, and then a series of hue pages, and some horizontal sections through the space as well. This page represents the outside of the Munsell solid, showing the highest chroma chip for each hue and value. The Munsell system was revised thoroughly in what's called the Munsell Renotation, published in 1943, which adjusted the hue, value and chroma scales to make them more perceptually even, based on extensive data from human observers. Although no longer based directly on physical experiments with spinning disks, as was Albert Munsell's original system, opposite hues in the Munsell system remain close to additive complementaries. In addition, in the renotation, the Munsell system was tied in with the CIE system of colorimetry that had also been developed in the first decades of the 20th century. And specifically, every Munsell notation of the same value was defined to reflect light of the same luminance under a standard daylight illuminant called a luminant C. Luminance is a measure of visible energy of light that the CIE had developed in 1924 to factor in the varying responsiveness of the human visual system to different wavelengths of light called the luminous efficiency function. Now there's an important thing to be aware of here in the judgments of brightness, depending on how they're made, can contain a component associated with high chromatic intensity in addition to brightness related to luminance. This perception of higher chroma colours as being brighter than lower chroma colours of the same value seems to relate to their lower blackness. For example, we might easily get the impression that the highest chroma value red here is brighter than the value 5 grey in the same horizontal row and might judge it to match a grey of value 6 or even 7 or 8. Yet if we place one of these higher valued greys in contact with the value 5 red, 
we can see that there is a distinct contrast in value at the edge and that the value 6 grey is the lighter of the two, even though the red has a more glowing appearance. Value in the Munsell system should therefore be judged by finding the least contrasting grey in this way, rather than based on a general impression of lightness, which can be influenced by the added brightness associated with high chroma, which is called the helmholtz kollrausch effect. Munsell's friend or friendly rival, Denman Ross, published a related color order system at about the same time, classi classifying colors according to color, meaning hue, value, meaning lightness, and intensity or neutralization for intensity of color. Ross's system was not accompanied by an atlas of color chips and is more symmetrical in structure the hues reaching maximum intensity at different values, but these maximum intensities being depicted as equal in magnitude. Intensity in the Ross system thus refers to chroma relative to the maximum possible for a given hue. Neutralization in Ross's scheme refers to chroma relative to the maximum deemed possible for a given hue and value. Ross employed a simple hue circle in which red, yellow and blue are evenly spaced, adapted from one that had been used by the Prang Company. In Ross's version, each of the colours is mixed from a specified list of paint ingredients, and opposite colours were intended to be paint mixing complementaries rather than visual complementaries of the original Munsell system. It would be possible to create paint mixtures from these ingredients where each pair in fact neutralized each other, although the circuit of hues would be quite uneven perceptually, as it places a bluish green, viridian, only two steps away from yellow, and reds and oranges are more stretched out. Ross devised a value scale of nine unnumbered steps, including black and white, and thus similar in practice to the Munsell system, in which 0 and 10 are the theoretical extremes, and actual paints were shown in the atlases of this time as spanning just 9 steps including black on value 1 and white on value 9. Rather optimistically, Ross assumes that for each hue step away from yellow in this circle, the value for the maximum intensity regularly goes down one step, from yellow reaching its maximum intensity at a highlight value to violet reaching its maximum intensity at low dark. Ross promoted his system as a basis for creating set palettes organized and often highly elaborate arrangements of palette colors pre-mixed in relation to his scales of value and hue. This idea influenced a number of painters in America, including George Bellows and Robert Henry. In Ross's system, each hue page is shown as a simple triangle in which the maximum intensity diminishes regularly from its peak towards higher and lower values, resulting in the arrangement we see here. Ross's student and later colleague, Arthur Pope, took the step, which Ross didn't want to take, of combining all of those triangles into a three-dimensional color solid. When you do this, you get an elegant double cone structure with a sharp edge at the top and bottom and an oblique and gracefully curved equator. In contrast, the Munsell colour solid is irregular in plan view. The precise shape will be different depending on what paints are used. This shows the colours of the Munsell Book of Colour Glossy Edition. 
and this shows the range of colours you get from mixing 60 Windsor and Newton oil paints. Please try to focus on the shape of this solid and not on the wonky mouse pad work. It seems reasonable to regard the Pope colour solid as a first order approximation of the more accurate Munsell colour solid. Pope built on Denman Russell's idea in other ways, and in particular, he developed the idea of saturation as now defined by the CIE and recognised that this was different to chroma. Using saturation, he divided up the triangular hue pages by lines radiating from black and realised that these lines of uniform saturation would be important because if we were painting an object under a single light source, we'd expect the colours of our paints to follow one of those lines. Saturation aligns with the S in the HSB colour space that I mentioned before. On a Munsell hue page, colours on a vertical column have the same chroma, while colours on one of these radiating lines have the same saturation, which you may be able to recognise as the same overall purity in the sense that the light reaching your eye from all of these high saturation swatches is relatively free of white light. Pope further realised that the colours of paints we would use to represent a multicoloured object under varying intensities of the same illumination would keep the same relationship relative to each other on the triangle. And a long time ago I made these demonstrations on the left showing how his principle works. It really does look like uniformly coloured stripes going from light to shadow. Pope also gave a model for what would happen with coloured objects disappearing into a mist, as on the right, showing paint colours moving towards the colour of the mist. Fans of James Gurney might be pleased to see Pope anticipating Gurney's diagrams of gamut masking in 1922. Wilhelm Ostwald was a German chemist who became inspired to create his own colour order system when he met Albert Munsell on a visit to Boston in 1905 to give lectures in chemistry. This is another model that's been confused with lightness-based systems because it has a series of greys up the centre, but it's not based on lightness at all. It's instead based on black content and white content. Every colour is considered to have a white component, a black component, and a pure colour component. And colours are classified according to the balance of these three components. The system was widely used in the early to mid 20th century, and many textbooks using it were published throughout this period. The system is geometrically similar to the modern natural colour system, or NCS, which differs in being based on perceptual judgments rather than spinning disc mixtures, as the Ostwald system was. In this sense, one could say that the NCS has a relationship to the Ostwald system, not unlike the relationship between the modern perceptual Munsell system and Albert Munsell's original physically based system. I'd like to finish with a bit about the reception of the Munsell system in the first half of the 20th century. That is, what impact did it have at the time on art and design education? An indication of the popularity of the system is that Munsell's book A Colour Notation had gone through 10 editions and even more numerous printings by 1947. 
and continued to be published right up to the 17th edition in 1992, when it was replaced in 1994 by the new Munsell Student Colour Set, now in its 6th edition. The Munsell system also featured in numerous design textbooks of various kinds. An early one was Arthur Wesley Dow's Composition, a series of exercises, which uses the Munsell framework from the 7th edition onwards. De Gamo and Winslow from 1924 on the left have a whole section on the Munsell framework using Cleland's descriptions and figures. Goldstein on the right uh, uses both the Munsell and the Ross framework. And writing in 1940 in a textbook on industrial design, Van Doren says that up to that point, the Munsell system had had the greatest influence on colour thinking and standardisation. Particularly influential was Maitland Graves' book, The Art of Colour in Design from 1941. Graves taught at the Pratt Institute in New York and devised a classification of compositions based on the distribution of values in relation to the Munsell system that's still in use today. Ross was less fortunate than Munsell with some of the people promoting his system. Frank Alva Parsons' book presents the Ross framework alongside the theory that light is made of red, yellow and blue rays, presented as if it was current science, as well as some appallingly racist colour psychology. And crediting Parsons for inspiration, Snow and Froelich's small book uh, from 1918 presents a remarkably large proportion of the simplistic red-yellow-blue colour theory tenets that Johannes Itten is known for based on his The Art of Colour from 1961. Much better are a number of books written for painters from the 1920s and 1930s, and indeed among the latter, in contrast to books for designers, Ross's framework seems to be more commonly used than Munsell's. We can get a snapshot of what sources were influential around mid-century in the USA at least, from the results of a survey conducted by Royal B. Farnham who analysed 35 responses from individuals from a wide range of educational institutions. When asked what colour theory they would teach, the responses from colleges and universities included Munsell 13 times, Ross 6 times, and Helmholtz and Ostwald 5 times each. Among the art colleges and art schools, the results were Munsell and Ross nine times each, and Ostwald eight times. When asked what books they used, a large list resulted, with Munsell, Graves, who uses the Munsell framework, and Ostwald in the lead. This result ties in nicely with a paper that I published with Eva Fay last year at the AIC 2022 conference in Toronto. We examined a student portfolio from about 1945 at the East Sydney Technical College, now the National Art School Sydney, and we found that apart from two original illustrations by the teacher, Phyllis Shillito, all of the illustrations and the 44 pages of lecture notes found in the portfolio could be traced to just 10 sources. One important source was a book by H.B. Carpenter that teaches an experiential approach to colour using various colour exercises, but the remainder were various texts explaining the Ostwald and Munsell systems, including Graves. If you want to see more about that study, you can see the proceedings or this link to a recording of the presentation. That's all, and thank you from me. I'll stop sharing now.